Welcome to No Apologies on Beck, where we are unafraid to speak the truth. I am your host, Rick Becker, our co-host, Lori Hintz. How you doing? I am good. Mm -hmm. Good, good. I'm, I am day. well as well. Uh, this is going to be a blockbuster show. You're going to enjoy this very much. We are going to be a little later on talking to author and historian Clay Jenkinson, so we're looking forward to that. I am very much looking forward to that. We will wrap things up with a brain food later on, but first we are starting with the word that is on everybody's lips right now, and that is filibuster. Filibuster, filibuster. So it's not a big shocker. There's now a discussion. Um, on ending or changing the filibuster in the Senate. And uh, the filibuster is, uh, as opposed to the House, where you need 50% plus one to get something to pass, the filibuster has been this general concept, a, it rules in the Senate, where it requires more than a simple majority. And uh, what it requires, in essence, is a vote of 60. Right. And they, they go through a vote of cloture, which means that they're going to end the debate and go ahead and have the actual vote. If you can't vote to end the debate, which takes the 60, then you never get to the vote. And so that's the filibuster. Now, when it deals with money, what they have been doing more recently, and I think, I think both the Republicans and the Dems have been doing this, right. I'm not sure. Um, but they will go through a budget reconciliation process, and I, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, the big one was Obamacare, uh, but they've done they've done it a few times since that. But but when it has other uh, implications other than big budget budgetary concerns, it's it's policy. Uh, it does need to have that 60 member vote, 60 percent out of the 100. Now it's been coming up a lot lately, just simply because everyone is talking about HR one. HR one is the essential election <coughs> takeover bill that is being uh, put forth, and because of the 50-50 in the Senate, it looks like it could be a very interesting debate in the Senate. Right. So, yeah, Lori, you and I had discussion before on H.R. 1. And I was feeling, I, I believe it's a, a really horrendous bill and a, and a takeover by the federal government of the elections that should be run by the states. Um, in addition to that, it seems to, to uh, edify, to put in stone measures that make it much more easy to... to um, uh, have, fraud. have fraudulent voting. Yes, um, but I was a little bit less concerned because I thought it's never going to get it's never going to get sixty votes, and so now we're looking at something, <laughs> right, um, which this... is of significant concern. It is. So less than four years ago, when Donald Trump was president and Mitch McConnell was the majority leader, sixty-one senators including more than 25 Democrats, signed their names in opposition to any efforts that would curtail the filibuster. A GOP aide told uh, this to Fox News, and we have an article that we're going to show you a little bit of, about, too. Other than the occupant of the White House and the balance of power in the Senate, what has changed now from that time to this time? Well, let's show a graphic here from this same article. So this article from Fox News says Democrats distanced themselves from previous pro-filibuster stance, citing GOP obstruction. And the quote that I had pulled here is, the legislative filibuster has been a 60-vote threshold for what is called a cloture vote, just as, as Rick just said, or a vote to end debate on a bill, meaning that any 41 senators could prevent a bill from getting to a final vote. If there are not 60 votes, the bill cannot proceed. Now, if you go to the next quote here, uh, this one says, the talking filibuster is what probably people are most familiar with, as it was most recently seriously articulated by Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon in 2012, would allow 41 senators to prevent a final vote by talking incessantly. Remember the whole green eggs and ham and reading things on the floor? Right. This is what this is talking about, around the clock, on the Senate floor. But once those senators stop talking, the threshold for cloture vote is lowered to 51. So yeah. with this one, at this point, the filibuster becomes highly important with HR 1. It does. I, <clears throat> my opinion on it has been that I, I think the filibuster is generally a good idea. Generally. You, you, without something like that 60 uh, percent rule, you have much bigger fluctuate, fluctuations in legislation. Correct. And every two years, it can be suddenly we're going this way and we're going that way. Right. Um, and it requires far less agreement overall, and then, in theory, you would get something that is much less moderate and can be either very much in one side or the other. Polarizing, no so question. So I, th I think that that's good. Mm -hmm. However, my thought has been, listen, if one side wants to end it, 
Um, I mean, but then everybody has to live by that well, at least until ahead, they change the it again is, and bring it back. Pendulum always swings. Right. There's always repercussions, mm -hmm. and we saw that when when um, uh, the senator from Arizona, I believe, ended the the uh, filibuster aspect for confirming judges. Oh yes. And. Um, and then, and then that came to pass and, and bite the Dems in the butt when the Republicans well, did the same thing. And that's the thing. If you do away with it, then it's going to come back to haunt you at some point in the <clears> future, <throat> likely, too. So we have another article that um, we pulled up, too. And this one is uh, a little different. This one is talking about, uh, this is from the Washington Examiner. And this one is talking about with his false filibuster history. Biden is playing with fire. And it's kind of, as Rick alluded to, uh, Democrats now want to reform the filibuster in order to abuse their power and gain a political advantage. They do not seek to do it out of some concern for democracy. And that seems to be the case, too, is that it seems to be a tactic. As a tactic, the filibuster has always been a frustrating tool for Senate majorities, but a stabilizing one for the nation's laws and long-term policies. The possibility of a filibuster forces the parties to work together more, as you said, than they would have to otherwise and limits short-term variations in federal statutes. Now, this is important because working together is not exactly what the Senate is known for doing at this point. And no. HR1 is extremely onerous. It has, you know, we have gone and done shows about this program, has, we have ad nauseum talked about HR1, but just as a brief recap, it would take off limits for um, any type of rules that would uh, limit fraud for voting. You would have 16-year-olds voting. You would have felons be able to vote. You would have um, illegal immigrants be able to vote. You would be able to vote in one place and essentially go to another place, make up a name, and vote again because you're not allowed to verify your name. Um, so many, many, many things that are going to just be a complete change to our elections, and they would no longer be fair and transparent by any means. In fact, they'd be wide open. Now, I, I don't know to what degree this may enter into it, but I, I think I view Biden's uh, administration, which is really more of a, of, a, of a group. You know, I've said he's a Manchurian candidate. Right. Maybe it's a Harris administration, but whatever it is. He actually it's called an her extension. President Harris today. No, really? He did. <laughs> uh, it's, it's kind of an extension of the Obama administration, more or less, um, mm -hmm. except on, uh, it's, it, on steroids. It's turbocharged. And when, when President Obama indicated that he was going to fundamentally transform America, I believe uh, that, that what we're looking at is this current administration, uh, Congress, as it currently exists, believes that this is the time. Uh, they, they need to strike while the iron is hot. They learned, we've said this before, uh, from Obama not uh, accomplishing nearly as much as he wanted in his first two terms, Trump accomplishing not nearly as much as he wanted in his two terms. They, I believe, want to go full bore and fundamentally change America. And they've got another year and a half or so to do it. Right. And, and I, I think this is the way, if I was of their mindset, um, I, this is the way I would do it. You know, we talked not only about HR1, which really does fundamentally transform ex how we do things and may make it difficult for any other party to regain control at any time Correct. because of the control of the, of the elections. But we were talking about HR127, uh, the Sabika Sheik bill right. for gun, where it, it, it creates, it, it turns all gun owners essentially into criminals unless they go through really significant onerous steps and fees. I mean, one thing after another after another, this is, this is a fundamental concern. Well, Democrats now want to reform the filibuster in order to abuse their power. But uh, I have, I've seen where Biden wants, um, has he, he has said that he wants to do a kind of a, an alternate filibuster too, just a, like a little softer version of the filibuster. And I don't know exactly how one can do that, but that- Well, that'd be the talking filibuster that you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. um, but really what we've seen for, for the talking filibusters with Rand Paul, I right. think that was, I, he, don't drone me, bro. <laughs> right, um, right. And Ted Cruz with the green eggs and ham. What you're right. looking at is that's not a true filibuster. That's those guys standing up and talking for as long as they can to garner attention to their concerns, and they're doing it because they don't have the 40 votes. Right. Because if they had the 40, 40 votes, they wouldn't need to stand up. They would just be able to prevent vote of cloture. You are going to be hearing more and more lately about, I mean, coming up about the filibuster. So we thought we would talk about that just to start the show tonight, just because it's going to be in the news quite a bit. And when we come back, we will introduce you to author, and he is, well, very prolific, Clay Jenkinson next when we come back.
When you can't find answers to your recurring health challenges, it can feel like your health and your future are being held hostage. The Wellness Way is a network of health restoration clinics that think and act differently to solve the health challenges others can't. Here, we disrupt the standard approach to care through a combination of testing, individual plans, and one-on-one -on -one guidance, putting your health and your future where they belong, in your own hands. 40 years ago, Aero Service Team started with one truck and lots of hard work. Times may have changed, but the hard work that we put in to get your lives back in order after fire, water, and disaster hasn't. Over the years, we've seen so many families lose their belongings due to water and fire damage. Restoring homes back to the original state has made every hour of hard work well worth it. Thank you for trusting our family with yours. When disaster strikes, you only have to make one call. Aero Service Team does it all. It's every American's right to bear arms. At Mandan Sporting Goods, we're here to help you support your Second Amendment rights, which reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Whether you're looking for a pistol for personal defense or collector gun, we have the staff to help you. We also have the area's largest inventory of ammo and reloading supplies. Mandan Sporting Goods, the area's local gun and ammo specialists. 40 years ago, Aero Service Team started with one truck and lots of hard work. Times may have changed, but the hard work that we put in to get your lives back in order after fire, water, and disaster hasn't. Over the years, we've seen so many families lose their belongings due to water and fire damage. Restoring homes back to the original state has made every hour of hard work well worth it. Thank you for trusting our family with yours. When disaster strikes, you only have to make one call. Aero Service Team does it all. Every great pizza has a secret. At New York To Go, that secret lies in our perfectly recreated New York water, the key ingredient to making our signature New York-style pizza. We also feature Yiro's, with the region's only Yiro meat spit, plus Nathan's hot dogs, calzones, and our delicious jumbo buffalo wings. Try a 14-inch or our special giant 20-inch pizza tonight. You gotta know how to fold them if you wanna hold them. New York To Go, we deliver for you. Life changes, so what's on your horizon? Horizon Financial Bank has been helping North Dakotans with financial goals since 1905. And now we're here to serve you in Bismarck. We're North Dakota proud, and being from North Dakota means something. A bank with small town roots. We've crossed many horizons, and now we're here to help you cross yours. We're Horizon Financial Bank for the changes on your horizon. Welcome back to No Apologies on Beck. I'm so very, very pleased to uh, welcome and introduce our guest, Clay Jenkinson. Uh, he is a historian and author, host of a national radio program called the Thomas Jefferson Hour, which I have been enjoying very much, and editor at large for governing.com. And um, well, welcome, welcome, Clay. So glad to be here. I, Thank I, you. I really am excited to have you on. So I'm not going to commandeer the mic, but I want to tell you. Governing.com, I, I get, I get the, the online magazine, and there's a lot of stuff in there I pass through because I get a ton of stuff, as you might expect. But every once in a while, there was a, a headline uh, for an article that would hit my attention. And, and, uh, and I read it and on, on this first one. I read through it. I'm like, well, that was a very, very interesting article. And it was only then I looked up, and here you are, me. the author. Oh, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, it was, it was fantastic. I've been so, writing for them for a number of months now, and we're doing this program called Listening to America. You know, it's my view that if you listen to MSNBC or Fox or even CNN, you're not really hearing America, you're hearing the punditry. And when you get out to Mott and Wadena and out into the countryside, you cheer up because you realize how much there's good in the American uh, character yeah. and how many people are really outside of the bubble that we spend our time talking about. I couldn't agree I with you I more. Can't. Disagree See, at all. <laughs> I totally when agree. When you, you, you frequently um, not impersonate, you're a pretender, I think is what you, <laughs> how you phrase it. Yes. Uh, you're a pretender for Thomas Jefferson. I am. And uh, I think you embody, at least you invoke his, his character very, very well. Thank and, you. and what I, I think what draws me to you somewhat, uh, even though I disagree with you on several things, but I agree with you on Ditto, several honey. things. You know. Sure. Uh, is that, that, that 
embodiment um, involves optimism that Thomas Jefferson has and that you, you um, cite. And I think that that's always so encouraging when you have a person who is well-reasoned and optimistic and willing to engage in civil discourse. And that's why I'm excited to have you on. Well, that's why I'm excited to be here. You know, I'm a Jeffersonian in that I believe that the people are up to it. They don't always exhibit that, but in the long run, he believed that we are up to the challenge of self-government. He believed that America was going to be the most extraordinary experiment in human history and that there was no end to what we can accomplish with reason and science and good sense. He was America's greatest optimist, and I have the glory and honor of being able to sort of embody that a little bit. Yeah, and I think you do it well. well so I, I threw out a, uh, maybe a direction for our discussion tonight um, that I think is, is so interesting and deserves a, a really close examination, and that is, uh, what is it, do you think, that is causing the strife in America, the division, the lack of civil discourse. Oh, it's so many things. We should make our senators and congressmen stay in Washington more than they do. They fly home so often to raise money that they don't any longer spend time together. I think that has really made a difference. The polarization, you know, I think people are frightened. So many people have been left behind. I think Donald Trump became president because he heard that. He heard the frustration, in the, especially in rural America, in the sense that America, the best of America is passing us by in some way. I think it's partly the condescension that the elites have shown to regular people, putting them down, um, being too woke for them, shaming them when they're not politically correct enough, uh, calling them deplorable. Mm -hmm. I think that is probably a, a stronger reason for the Trump phenomenon than any other single thing. And you know, when they found the all the emails from the Democrats, Podesta and company in 2016, almost the second most common word was Martha's Vineyard. And so there's the party of FDR wow. and Truman mm. hanging out on Martha's Vineyard and looking down on the people of North Dakota, looking down on the people of Wyoming, looking down on the people of Arkansas. Sure. And that drove the people into the hands of the other party, which historically has been the party of money. Absolutely. And so now we're in this deep national confusion about our identity because I don't think that the Trumpites are really Republicans in the fullest sense. I'm sure they disappoint you in some ways because they, they're more about grievance than they are about policy. And, and we need to get back to a conversation, I think, about policy. I agree with you in, in many, many respects. I think that maybe a slight uh, variation or nuance would be that um, they're not all about grievance, but they have found that they have been, uh, uh, I hate to say oppressed, but they, they, they've, been, they've been squashed and they've been ridiculed. And, and the, all they hear when, if they are to express something that they believe or that they, they think, um, they're, they're ridiculed and the ad hominem attacks, you know. If you don't say it this way, if you didn't say it correctly, you're racist or homophobic or... It goes know, both ways, of course. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it will certainly, Clay, it does go both ways, but I would say that um, in, no matter what the concern is, we will find people on both sides of whatever the division might be. But the question is not whether there exists on both sides, but whether it is the predominant aspect. And I would say that what led to Trump is the wokeness i mean you mentioned the the wokeness i mean that's clearly on on one side of the aisle of course and and the and i would say that the ad hominems really came from that side For, further i i think that on the left what we're looking at is a is is a desire to have a very very strong central government and you've got on the right in theory at least that there is a uh, an interest in having a weaker central government and more local and more you know self uh, rule and so forth. And so I wonder if it, that's probably, and that's what I think is, is the underlying phenomenon of it all, and I say this to put simplistically the Tenth Amendment. And if we could get away from a strong Washington, then the people in New York wouldn't need to put North Dakota down because we wouldn't affect them, and, and vice versa. Well, I'm a Tenth Amendment guy. Jefferson believed the Tenth Amendment was almost the most important of them. Those powers not delegated to the national government belong instead to the to states the and to the people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We're a federalist system of a dual sovereign. And I think that that got swallowed up in the second half of the 20th century for, for good reasons. 
And then we've been moving since the Reagan election in 1980 towards a different model, a kind of a lowering the intensity of the central government. It's almost impossible to stop that juggernaut, however. Sure. And now I think, I mean, I'll just say frankly, I think that President Trump would have been reelected resoundingly had he stepped up to the pandemic and, and asserted the national government. So there are times when we need it. And if he had, I think, been a good manager of the pandemic, he would have been overwhelmingly reelected. The economy was great. Uh, people liked the fact that he was a non-standard sort of a political figure. He was enormously charismatic. But there are times when we do need government, when there's a disaster, a hurricane, a, a tornado. Now, you may disagree, but I think that managing the pandemic is truly a national affair. And I, I, I do like the fact that different states have had different management styles. I think we need to preserve that. But some things have to be federally coordinated, I feel. That's interesting. I, I don't disagree that that may have brought him to a second term. I mean, there's a lot of those possibilities. I'm thankful he didn't because I don't think it was within the purview of the federal government. And as we see the way things have played out, it, it really wasn't necessary, uh, again, in my opinion. Um, but I, I, uh, there are many things in which I think he did go to a stronger central government and did do things that were outside of what we small, the, Thomas Jefferson, minarchist, right? A yes. Very, very, almost an anarchist. Oh, he was theoretically He's, an anarchist. Theoretically, I don't. There's no such thing as an anarchist. There's just. But he said that, if he looked at American <clears throat> Indians and said no constitutions, no penal systems, no social hierarchies, and of course he was being a little naive. But yeah. nevertheless, <laughs> he said that's the ideal: no government at all. But because we're European derived, and because our numbers are so many, we need some. And Madison said, even more to the point, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. And so yes. that's, the, that's where this debate has to be. I'm, for the, I'm with Jefferson, the least government that can make this work, but enough government to make it work. And, and you know, you do this every single day in the legislature. Those aren't easy decisions. You can't be an ideologue and make that work very often. True. I think we can agree on the general sentiment. I would like to keep it at the state level. I don't think that we need Washington. We don't need Washington to do anything, um, uh, frankly, for our benefit if we can do it ourselves. And it's interesting, I brought a book on the table um, called The Great Debate, and it's, it's uh, between Thomas Paine and Edmund Burke. Okay. And I, I just I put it out there for tonight specifically because you're here, because I think that you have, and well, along with Jefferson, it was a, a little bit more of a Thomas Paine, true democracy, viva la revolution in, in, in France kind of approach versus Edmund Burke, which is a rule of law, which may be... Gradualism, conservative yes, progress. exactly. I, you know, I'm not of any one ideo ideology because I, I find myself all over the map, but I believe that government should be exceedingly hesitant to take money out of your pocket. That it I should, agree with it that. It should always ask hard questions about whether that's just. But Clay, <laughs> Clay, but, but you, you love redistribution. Do I? I think you do. Hold on for that thought here because. I have a feeling that's coming in the second We segment. are going to be back, folks. Redistribution. With us. Wow. I hope I get some. <laughs>
We've crossed many horizons, and now we're here to help you cross yours. We're Horizon Financial Bank for the changes on your horizon. 40 years ago, Aero Service Team started with one truck and lots of hard work. Times may have changed, but the hard work that we've put in to get your lives back in order after fire, water, and disaster hasn't. Over the years, we've seen so many families lose their belongings due to water and fire damage. Restoring homes back to the original state has made every hour of hard work well worth it. Thank you for trusting our family with yours. When disaster strikes, you only have to make one call. Aero Service Team does it all. Every great pizza has a secret. At New York To Go, that secret lies in our perfectly recreated New York water, the key ingredient to making our signature New York-style pizza. We also feature gyros with the region's only gyro meat spit, plus Nathan's hot dogs, calzones, and our delicious jumbo buffalo wings. Try a 14-inch or our special giant 20-inch pizza tonight. You gotta know how to fold them if you wanna hold them. New York To Go, we deliver for you. It's every American's right to bear arms. At Mandan Sporting Goods, we're here to help you support your Second Amendment rights, which reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Whether you're looking for a pistol for personal defense or collector gun, we have the staff to help you. We also have the area's largest inventory of ammo and reloading supplies. Mandan Sporting Goods, the area's local gun and ammo specialists. Welcome back to No Apologies on Beck, your after hours oasis of sanity. And Mr. Jenkinson is a very sane person. He has a very calming, calming voice, and that means he's sane. I do really like concerned. your voice. I have to admit, I'm a purveyor of voices, so I'm really enjoying Purveyor? I am, I am a big fan of good voices. So, so listen, we, we hit a topic I want to hit on, but first, <laughs> I want to plug your book. Pull the graphic up. So uh, Clay's Here got comes. a new book coming out in six weeks, Essays on the Future of North Dakota. That certainly looks like the Little Missouri River. Uh, but look, Rick, I put in, I, this was painted by a friend of mine up yes. in Animus. Her name is Katrina Kay. She's a terrific artist. She's uh -huh. living on a ranch. And I asked her to paint the Little Missouri River Valley, the Badlands, a, a thunderstorm coming in, some cottonwoods in October, including some dead cottonwoods. But I said, and I want a little oil well, because we don't want to have a romantic view of North Dakota. We have to the absorb future. the state as it is. You know what? I like that. That was a nice touch. Isn't that cool? Um, all right. Very good. So enough about selling your book. The well, language I haven't of sold it all yet, but <laughs> now what is it coming out? Six weeks. It'll be out at the end of May. The language of I love cottonwoods because they make me feel at home because I grew up with them, mm -hmm. but they are a crappy tree. They are messy. They are. They fall. They fall. They have a very narrow. <laughs> Where did you base. grow up? Uh, well, in Mandan, but we had a uh, trailer on the on the river. And I currently live in the river bottoms north of Bismarck. Good for you. Well, the cottonwood is North Dakota's tree. Yes. Right. And Lewis and Clark could not have gotten to the Pacific without the cottonwood. It's a True. bad, it's a bad lumber. Roosevelt built the Elkhorn cabin with cottonwood logs, and oh. they they fall apart. It's not good timber, no. but it's our tree. It is our tree, and I love it. It makes me feel at home. And they're so beautiful. They don't last long in in the uh, campfire, though. They burn up pretty quickly. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so let's get serious, Clay. All right. So, um, I, I, before we came out of the last segment, I accused you of being a redistributionist. But you're not going to do apology, even though you do no apology. No, I do. we don't do apologies <laughs> here, at least not when we're speaking the truth. All right, so, good. Um, so, you, you claim that, to some degree at least, um, Jefferson was also a redistributionist. I was concerned in, in reading this book, which you so very nicely offered, at least someone on your behalf offered it to all the legislators. I gave it to each legislator. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to sign it. Right. So um, that's not Dr. Seuss. I was a little concerned you were calling Jefferson a Marxist, uh, no. reading between the lines. But tell, tell, me, tell me how you view redistribution. We, we could just talk forever, but redistribution and really the bigger picture when we talk about redistribution is about income inequality. But tell me your thoughts on redistribution. Well, when I'm putting myself in his time and place now. Okay. So he thought as long as you can keep buying more land in the West, you don't ever need to redistribute because people can move out there and open up their little farms and that solves the problem. But once you've peopled the entire country, now there are going to be accumulations of wealth in the hands of the few and there is going to be a time when there are people who would work and could work but can't find an economic opportunity in this system. 
And so he's quoting from Locke and others saying that you either have a right to a farm or the economic equivalency of a farm, and if the culture can't provide that, you had better do something or you're going to have an armed French-style revolution where people take back property at the end of a torch or a pitchfork. And so he then wrote this famous letter to Madison saying, I hope this never, ever, ever happens. I'm not, a, I'm not in favor of government intervention. I like people to have their property. But there may be times when we need to redistribute carefully to make sure that no one who's born in this country is denied a capacity to feed and clothe himself. And so he, want, he kept saying, I hope there are more Louisiana territories. That, <laughs> that prevents this problem. And the Homestead Act was one of the greatest things that ever happened to this country. But the few and the many, you know, he knew from reading Roman history, from reading French history, from reading the history of all of Europe, that the, the struggle of the few and the many turns out to be one of the most volatile of all struggles, and that it's better to be proactive in managing this than to be reactive when the pitchfork comes into the Senate House. Sure. What I would say to that, though, is that when you're looking at these ancient societies uh, and looking at the social inequities and income inequities, in essence, there, those were, those were sort of static, right? In a capitalist society, there may be income inequality. However, the standard of living it's for, up and up and up. for all goes wonderfully up. So a system in which there's, there, there's no, there is no system where there's no in, income inequality. Now, maybe communism is close, but there's inequality in other ways as in political advantage. Uh, but don't you think it's far better to have a significant uh, disparity in income and, um, and less redistribution if that system also provided a higher standard of living for those at the top and the bottom? Of course, and, and please don't make me a Marxist here. Jefferson's view was that everyone has a right to live. In other words, he would say everyone has a right to a living wage if they're willing to do the work. No, we're not gonna hold people up who are lazy, but if they're willing to do the work. The problem is, well, the great thing about America is that we've grown the pie and grown the pie and grown the pie over and over, and so we've really bought off this discontentment. And when I went around North Dakota driving to write this book, the farms look great, new trucks, there's paint on the barns. It, I feel like Harold Macmillan, the British prime minister, who said in 1957 to the British people, you've never had it so good. North Dakotans have never had it so good. This is the most prosperous single moment in the history of North Dakota. And I congratulate the legislature for managing that windfall conservatively so that we can save the best of that money to invest in the future of this state because these, we're not always going to have flush times. But we, are, we have no cause to complain at this moment in North Dakota history. And if you don't believe that, just look at the way our great-grandparents had to live, hauling water to the trees, mm -hmm. um, watering their gardens, slopping hogs. Um, outhouse. The, the outhouse at 40 below. <laughs> mm. right. And so, yes, of course, we, the miracle of capitalism coupled with America's resource base is that it has bought off discontentment and the entrepreneurial life. Jefferson couldn't have understood the entrepreneurial life the way we do. We can maybe innovate our way out of this. And the standard of living of every American, with some exceptions, is higher than any, humans being, any human beings who have ever lived on the face of the earth. Very true. So I'm with you on all of that. However, there is some percentage of the people who fall through the cracks. Theodore Roosevelt knew this. His cousin FDR knew this. We get it. And so the question is, what's the remedy? What's the Archimedean lever that can pull these people up or help them pull themselves up? Jefferson said education, education, education is the number one leavening force, and I'm with him on that. And I don't think we're doing a good enough job in the state, and I know you think we have too many institutions of higher education, and I do too. The question is, now what? Because once they're in, derooting them is way more difficult than creating them. Well, and in North Dakota, every kid who wants to go to college is going to college. And, and I would, uh, you know, challenge that to not be the case. And what we're finding is going to college isn't necessarily the pablum that... Not everyone is needing higher ed. Exactly. We need different types of post-secondary education, Correct. but not necessarily higher ed classically Correct. defined. Exactly. I'm with you on that. And I think that at some, you know, at some point we're going to have to have this conversation because the people of the state are restive about how much they spend on higher ed and the reduplications of higher ed. The, these institutions, the biggest mistake we ever made, in my opinion, was putting both of our flagship universities on the border of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. We would a be a really different people point. if yeah. one of them were here it is what it is. But, but we got the prison. 
So yes, so that was the bargain we made. I remember that. The people of North Dakota, are, they're not fed up with higher ed, but they're, as you know, very close to being fed up with it, and it's yes. only going to get worse. Well, we definitely don't want too many people going to the four-year colleges because we don't want too much competition for the job of humanities scholar. You know, I'm, you know, you made the right career choice. You, you're wealthy. You're powerful. You've been elected to office. Wow. Said, as a humanities scholar, you know, I live on ramen, even, <laughs> even generic ramen. So, you know, I'm glad I get to generic. do what I do. But there's not a lot of competition. Listen, we're going to be back. Hang with us. Another and final segment with Clay Jenkinson. Today's households have more digital devices than ever before. More links to family, business, education, and entertainment. That communication spent over 10 years building North Dakota's fastest fiber optic internet service. Beck Lightband Internet, outpacing speeds in large cities nationwide. Lightband Internet handles all your digital needs without throttling your connection to the world. Beck Communications, valuable digital connections in rural North Dakota. Life changes, so what's on your horizon? Horizon Financial Bank has been helping North Dakotans with financial goals since 1905. And now we're here to serve you in Bismarck. We're North Dakota proud, and being from North Dakota means something. A bank with small town roots. We've crossed many horizons, and now we're here to help you cross yours. We're Horizon Financial Bank for the changes on your horizon. Every great pizza has a secret. At New York To Go, that secret lies in our perfectly recreated New York water, the key ingredient to making our signature New York-style pizza. We also feature gyros with the region's only gyro meat spit, plus Nathan's hot dogs, calzones, and our delicious jumbo buffalo wings. Try a 14-inch or our special giant 20-inch pizza tonight. You gotta know how to fold them if you wanna hold them. New York To Go, we deliver for you. It's every American's right to bear arms. At Mandan Sporting Goods, we're here to help you support your Second Amendment rights, which reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Whether you're looking for a pistol for personal defense or collector gun, we have the staff to help you. We also have the area's largest inventory of ammo and reloading supplies. Mandan Sporting Goods, the area's local gun and ammo specialists. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and as you know, my passion is to help each and every one of you get the best sleep of your life. That's why I created my new Giza Dreams bed sheets. I started by using the world's best cotton called Giza. It's only grown in a region between the Sahara Desert, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Nile River. It's ultra soft and breathable, but extremely durable. My Giza sheets also include full 21 inch wide pillowcases that will fit over any pillow and deep pocket sheets that will fit over any mattress. The first night you sleep on my sheets, you'll never want to sleep on anything else. Go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen right now to get your very own MyPillow Giza Dream Sheets. Giza Dream Sheets are available in a variety of colors. Use your promo code and for a limited time, when you buy one set of sheets, you'll get another set absolutely free. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. You're back, we're back. It's No Apologies on Beck, and we have Clay Jenkinson now. Clay, uh, you indicated that you would like to take a, a, a stab at the uh, filibuster. Uh, Clay was in studio or I was in, listening in, to this, on yes. set when we were talking filibuster. Well, so just this little historical have note. At it. The Constitution of the United States does not create a filibuster. Mm -hmm. They were working with Montesquieu's notion of separation of powers so that we wouldn't just have a unicameral system. We would, we would distill the will of the people through several different mechanisms. Right. But both would work by majority rule that the House would work by majority rule and the Senate would work by majority rule and that would filter out sort of volatile or bad thinking. So somewhere along the line in our small C constitution, not one that's in the document but one we've adopted, we created the filibuster. And if you look historically at the filibuster, it was largely used to protect Southern uh, Jim Crow laws. Now that's not what it is anymore. But the filibuster is an anti-democratic fossil in our constitutional system. And I'm not saying it has to go. 
and I certainly wouldn't make it go in a partisan way as we are now contemplating. But it is a problem, and here's why, Rick. If Biden doesn't get some of the stuff done that he wants to do, he'll lose the House and maybe the Senate in 2022. Maybe your listeners think that's good. But then they will take over, and they will fail to get things done, and we're in this kind of paralysis. And while we're in this paralysis, China is moving forward, and India, and Argentina, and Brazil, we're going to have to face some problems, and we can't build the supermajority that, that cloture requires. So we either need to rethink this, or we need to develop a new national consensus so we can get enough votes to get some moderate things done in the middle, the great middle, I think, you know, 80, 60 to 80 percent of the American people are basically in the center. But we're now in a paralysis, and just watch. If he doesn't end the filibuster, the Republicans will take over in 2022 and 2024. They won't get anything done. The despair and the grievance and the frustration and the, and the, and the disillusionment will just continue until we wind up with an authoritarian system, I feel. Perhaps, but one could argue that it might be better for the American people if they don't get things done, um, because these things that get done tend to be wild, wildly going into debt. Um, well, I'll, ju I'll just leave it there. That's number one. One thing I just want to clarify, because you said uh, you referenced the filibuster for the, the uh, uh, Jim Crow uh, era. Jesse Helms talking for days on yep. the Senate floor. You know? and, um, and, and, but you in mentioned anti-democratic, and I want to be clear, it's anti-small D democratic. No, it's not anti-capital D democratic, right. it's anti Majority rule, right. let's put it that way. I just way. want to be clear for our right. viewers. I'm sorry, no, no. There's, I the, use the... there's a common notion about that whole era being, because Republicans, as you may know, are, are all racist, but in that era, it was well, the Democrats. Not all of them. I'm pretty sure all of them. A clear. bunch, let's say. No, but I'm not, pretty sure know, every one of us. All right. <clears throat> I, I think that's good insight. Um, I have, uh, again, been listening to your Thomas Jefferson Hour. And Please, everyone do. Yes, it's, it's very, it's entertaining. I, are, are you familiar with any other, um, um, I don't know, motif where, where someone has an hour like that and they take on the persona of a, of no, a historical figure? No, and it's an figure? insane idea. You know. It's a great idea. I love it. Um, what I'm wondering about is you've made mention of Thomas Jefferson's mentors, um, Montesquieu being one of them. Uh, you mentioned Bolingbroke, which... That's you, crazy. Especially on that religious on questions. Show. What's that movie? You had me at Hello? Yes. Yes. Right. Well, you had me at Bolingbroke. Wow. Bolingbroke <laughs> is my favorite. Now, this, this is an old business card of mine. On the back is my favorite Bolingbroke quote. In fact, my favorite political quote of all time. I just want you to have it. We're going to have a man crush going here. I you know, know, this is, right? wow. I knew. Like, oh, he's I needed a dictionary there. to fully understand it. You, I know you won't. Uh, you are a logophile. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> well, but anyway, tell, and I also, and I'm sorry, I'm taking up your time, and I want to no, 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 hear no, what no. you have to say. One of your mentors as well, I want to hear about him, Mike Jacobs. I love Mike Jacobs you on do. Grand Forks. Fantastic individual, strong liberal, doesn't matter. Mm. He's, 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 uh, he's so intelligent and, and so open-minded and so kind and so open to civil discourse. So I was fascinated to hear that you labeled him as one of your mentors. Oh, the, the mentor in my life. So I was working at the Dickinson Press as a cub reporter and photographer. I was 14 or 15, and he was the reporter. Ooh. And he was covering coal development back in the 70s when that was the issue. And he used to bail me out of high school to go take pictures for his articles. And we became dear friends. And you know, Jefferson said of William Small, his great mentor, he changed the destiny of my life. That's certainly true of Mike Jacobs, and I could not agree with you more. In many respects, he has been the North Dakotan, mm -hmm. most articulate, thoughtful. Yes, he's a liberal. He's not a leftist by any means. No, I agree. Uh, he's, a, he's even a conservative liberal in many respects, but he's thoughtful, and he's a brilliant prose stylist. And he took me out, and he said to me, I'll tell you, this was the greatest moment maybe of my life. I was 16 or so. We were driving in the Badlands, and he said, I don't want to know you unless you read books. I thought, how unfair can that be, you know? <laughs> I'm watching Three's Company, you know? <laughs> and he said, I do not want to know you unless you read books. And it, in my life, it pivots on that moment. Now, how about you? You have mentors. Well, uh, I do. They, well, you know, it's, it's cliche, but, you know, my dad is, is one of my mentors. And it's not he a cliche. Had, he had an extraordinarily tough upbringing, extraordinarily tough. In this state? Yes, yep. And uh, unbelievable. When I look at all of the benefits and good fortune that were bestowed upon me of no, none of my doing whatsoever, and I see what he did with his life, it, it pushes me to 
want to say, I, I need, I must do so much, everything that I can. And um, so, and, and there, there have been others too, naturally, but. Um, well, I'll tell you what I admire about you so much is that, you know, I don't very often, I suppose, agree with you in 100%, I'm sure it's mutual, but you read books, you speak in complete sentences, you make arguments, you, you think, and you reflect, and you're not a one note horn. And you know how many in the world today are the opposite of all those things. I'll, get, I'll put more books in your hands. I'll tell you a book to read is um, The Cycles of Constitutional Time. It's a new book by Jack Balkan. And here's what he argues. I'll be really quick about it. He said that we go in these cycles. So we had, say, the New Deal from 1932 until the Reagan Revolution. Now we've been in the Reagan Revolution until the Trump presidency. Mm -hmm. That's kind of run its course now. And now something else is going to happen. And we need to start thinking about what that's going to be. But he shows that these cycles go on in American history. And the last president in the cycle is always one term, Jimmy Carter. Yep, interesting. Donald Trump. And so we need to brace ourselves because we don't know what this is going to be. But it's not going to be Reagan's famous statement that the nine scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> Well, and it, it could be the implosion of the federal government, in which case we will have states. <laughs> We're close to collapse yeah, in some are. important respects. Clay, so, thank you. Very, my very thrill, much. thank We've you. Go. It was fun. Another I love time. having you on. Perhaps if you ever have a spare moment, we can have you on again. We'll become regulars. Oh, great. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, folks, there's his book once again. Uh, thanks. We are going to have one more segment. We're going to be talking about brain food nourishment for your noggin. Stick with us. We'll be right back. When you can't find answers to your recurring health challenges, it can feel like your health and your future are being held hostage. The Wellness Way is a network of health restoration clinics that think and act differently to solve the health challenges others can't. Here, we disrupt the standard approach to care through a combination of testing, individual plans, and one-on-one -on -one guidance, putting your health and your future where they belong, in your own hands. 40 years ago, Aero Service Team started with one truck and lots of hard work. Times may have changed, but the hard work that we put in to get your lives back in order after fire, water, and disaster hasn't. Over the years, we've seen so many families lose their belongings due to water and fire damage. Restoring homes back to the original state has made every hour of hard work well worth it. Thank you for trusting our family with yours. When disaster strikes, you only have to make one call. Aero Service Team does it all. Life changes, so what's on your horizon? Horizon Financial Bank has been helping North Dakotans with financial goals since 1905. And now we're here to serve you in Bismarck. We're North Dakota proud, and being from North Dakota means something. A bank with small town roots. We've crossed many horizons, and now we're here to help you cross yours. We're Horizon Financial Bank for the changes on your horizon. 40 years ago, Aero Service Team started with one truck and lots of hard work. Times may have changed, but the hard work that we put in to get your lives back in order after fire, water, and disaster hasn't. Over the years, we've seen so many families lose their belongings due to water and fire damage. Restoring homes back to the original state has made every hour of hard work well worth it. Thank you for trusting our family with yours. When disaster strikes, you only have to make one call. Aero Service Team does it all. Every great pizza has a secret. At New York To Go, that secret lies in our perfectly recreated New York water, the key ingredient to making our signature New York-style pizza. We also feature Yiro's, with the region's only Yiro meat spit, plus Nathan's hot dogs, calzones, and our delicious jumbo buffalo wings. Try a 14-inch or our special giant 20-inch pizza tonight. You gotta know how to hold them if you wanna hold them. New York To Go, we deliver for you. It's every American's right to bear arms. At Mandan Sporting Goods, we're here to help you support your Second Amendment rights, which reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Whether you're looking for a pistol for personal defense or collector gun, we have the staff to help you. We also have the area's largest inventory of ammo and reloading supplies. Mandan Sporting Goods, the area's local gun and ammo specialists.
Hello, hello, welcome back to No Apologies on Beck. That was really fun. Yeah. It was really I cool. enjoy I hope you guys enjoyed it. I enjoyed I it. I did too. I, I enjoyed really the did. heck out of it. I really did. All right, so now it's time for brain food, brain food. Brain food. I am starting today with a word that was suggested to me by a friend, and this word is foible. It's just a little weird word, foible. <laughs> it means basically the part of a sword or foil blade between the middle and the point. It is a noun, or it can also mean a minor flaw or shortcoming in character or behavior. It essentially means weakness. For those of you who may not know, the weakest part of a sword blade is that portion between the middle and the pointed tip. And back in the mid-1600s, English speakers borrowed the French word foible to refer to that most easily broken part of the sword or foil. And despite the superficial resemblance, foible does not come from foil. The French foible was an adjective meaning weak. Um, that French word, which is now obsolete, is derived from the old, same old French term feeble or fibble that gives us the word feeble. So feeble, weak, uh, it, apply, it appeared in print um, with the usage of being weak and of minor failings in character in 1673. And now the character flaw sense is considerably more popular than the original word application. But foible, weak, and foible. Um, weakness, frailty, shortcoming, or failing. Foible. foible. It sounds like a uh, uh, Three Stooges word. Foible. 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 Yeah, you're right. Actually, okay. he's not wrong. Okay, so All what right. do you have today? I have Knights Templar. Mm. Knights Templar. Let's hey, is that in uh, Raiders don't. of the Lost Ark? Uh, I thought you were going to... Okay, sure. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it is. I think I know that from Monty Python, no, too. No, it's not No, it's Monty not Monty Python. Python. No, it's not. Okay. I'm saying that in my so ear. So listen, uh, on this day, okay. on this day, okay. in... Uh, 1307, it was a great year. Um, <laughs> in 1307, it pretty much put an end to the Knights Templar. Now, the Knights Templar, think about the Crusades. Right. So the Knights Templar was a club, and they'd get together and put don their, don their special white garb and then go out to the Middle East and um, do what the Crusaders did. So the Knights Templar... Um, we're having some, some down times um, coming into the 14th century. Uh, they lost a few battles out in the Middle East. They were becoming a little less popular. And then King Philip IV of France, he owed the, the Knights Templar, these crusaders, a ton of money. Aha! Now, they were already starting to lose public sentiment. See, this is the key, politically speaking. Mm -hmm. Watch your backside if the populace is if not with you. lose the public. Always, always, always. There's a yep. million examples of that. So the, the populace was not really with them. King Philip IV was like, I owe these guys so much money. I think what we're going to do is arrest them all for heresy. Well, that works. Right. So what they did is they, they rounded up the, the last of the crusaders of the Knights of Templar, and they tortured them until they confessed to spitting on a cross. Uh, Which, of course, they had not done, but they, they confessed to. I'm assuming. You know, I didn't get, I didn't get the diaries straight from, okay. from them. But... Um, and then they recanted, in which case then they were, they were tried and found guilty a second time of heresy because they uh, lied about recanting. The first time. Got so it. they were burned at the stake. Um, they were burned alive, all these Knights Templar, on this day in 1307. So. Wow. That was dark. I'm a dark guy. Okay, going on to the next word. My next word is the word impunity. I saw this in a, an article that I was reading. And um, exemption or freedom from punishment, harm, or loss. It is a noun. Uh, laws were flouted with impunity is the way you could use it in a sentence. Some synonyms would be exemption or immunity. So impunity and immunity are very, very close. Uh, impunity, like the words pain, penal, and punish, traces to the Latin noun pena, P-O-E-N-A, meaning punishment. Hmm. So exemption, impunity. Do something with impunity means without any type of backlash. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have one. Uh, and naturally, as mine always are, it is related. This is Saladin. Saladin. So he was a, uh, a Muslim warrior, uh, basically a Muslim knight. Mm. And he fought the Crusaders. 
and uh, he fought them very well. He was, he, he kicked some crusader butt, frankly. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I mean, there's so much history here. It's kind of, remember my black hole? Yep. I brought up a topic yep. that's too... Too he, much to the, go to. He, he, they, there was a lot of stuff going on with Jerusalem and the Middle East and fighting, and they win, and they do this and that. King Richard, um, think, think uh, Robin Hood. Right. King Richard and Saladin were, uh, I'm not going to say friends, because they, they fought Allies? each other. But they, were, they had a, a great deal of mutual respect. Interesting. A great deal. And they sent gifts to each other, on and on. So Saladin's victories, in part, caused the weakening of the Knights Templar, which then gave King Philip IV in France the cojones to arrest them and accuse them of heresy, um, causing the end of the Knights Templar. Very, very interesting history today. We've had some good stuff today. It is, it is. So on our final show of the week, coming up tomorrow, we will discuss Moody's forecast. We will have a guest. Yeah, Assistant Majority Leader Scott Lauser is with us again. He's got some stuff which I'm not sure if you're going to find interesting, but you may as well tune in and see if he surprises <laughs> us all. And we will also finish the week with a fabulous off the cup, so be sure to join us next time.